Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Tyrannus Hall, a grace-filled space to talk about the missional mandate of the Canadian Reformed Churches. And today, Pastor Bill and I, we're going to be interviewing Mr. Ray Pennings. And so if you don't know who Ray is, you know a bunch of the work or a bunch of the organizations that he has worked with in the past. Ray was the founding president of EduDeo, which a lot of our listeners will know. He's been the chairman of Redeemer University in the past. For the last 21 years, uh, 21 years ago, he, he founded or co-founded the faith-based think tank Cardus. And he's been involved in various ways in Canadian politics over the, the last, yeah, a couple, uh, couple of decades. And so we're really happy to have Ray here. Ray is, is special also to myself. Him and his wife, Kathy, attend our congregation in Ottawa when they're in, they're in Ottawa. And so we're really happy to have Ray here to talk to us about culture and how we think about that and how we interact with that. So Ray, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Well, Ray, yeah, I'm so excited that you, uh, we have you as a guest today, and you have, of course, a very long history of being involved in politics and culture. I don't want to make you sound older than you are, but you also have some theological acumen, and you have a seminary degree, and I thought it might be profitable for you to begin to give us the lay of the land, biblically speaking. What are the images and metaphors that the Bible provides for us when we think about how Christians relate to culture? Yeah, thanks. I, I appreciate that because I think it is important to sort of set the biblical foundations because often our conversations about Christians in public life take place framed by the politics or the news of the day. And it's, I, I think, foundational for us if we're going to differentiate ourselves, not simply to put a few proof texts and biblical covers on the issues of the day, but, but dig back to the foundations. Most, most listeners, I suspect, will be familiar with sort of the core elements of a Christian world, you creation, fall, redemption, restoration, and understanding the elements of that. You know, when we start talking about culture, what exactly do we mean by culture? And there are various definitions out there. Andy Crouch, in, in his book, Culture Making, talks about cu culture as what we make of the world, the, the elements of creation, what, what we do with them. Another meaning of culture that is fairly prevalent is the unspoken rules by which we live by. And obviously, if we're going to talk about the rules and the norms that we live by, we need to think of how they compare to, to the rules that God has given us along the way. I think there are several metaphors, and it's interesting. You often can tell where, how Christians have been trained or think of the culture by the me metaphor they default to. The Bible uses several different metaphors, which, which imply different postures towards the culture. Obviously, you know, the culture sometimes is thought of the world, the church in the world, and the contrast is drawn. And then often we think of the fact of warfare, worldliness being evil. And you go to passages like Ephesians 6, and when it comes to relating to the spirits of the age, the Christian is to put on the whole armor of God. We also have various passages which talk about the culture and Christians' relation to it in terms of being strangers and aliens and pilgrims. We're, we're walking through. And again, the emphasis is on, on separation, on distance. I think and, and, and those are biblical metaphors, and, and we need to contend with them. And there are certain aspects of our walk and relationship with the culture that, that certainly reflect warfare, reflect pilgrimage. I think a particular underemphasized metaphor that I find very helpful is the metaphor of ambassador. On a couple of times, Paul in his writing talks about the fact that Christians are called to be ambassadors of Christ. And what's interesting in those passages is tied to the ministry of reconciliation. And the fact is, when we are an ambassador, what does that mean? Well, just think of an embassy. Just think of an ambassador to a different country. You go to that country, you're sent there. You're sent there with a mission. And I, you know, I know this podcast thinks very much in terms of being a missional church. We are sent there as we are sent into the world as Christians with a mission from God. We're sent with a purpose. 
secondly, we are in another country. We are not citizens of that country. With Abraham, even in terms of the promise, we seek, we seek a city whose foundations are above, but not the here and now. But we are living in this land. You know, Jeremiah 29 is a common passage that is referred to in which the people of Israel are talking, you know, they're in exile. This isn't their homeland. This isn't the promised land. But when they're in exile, they are to build houses. They are to, to marry their wives. They are to seek the good of the city, for in the good of the city you will have peace. And so I think all of these metaphors have their place. I think at our time, the ambassador metaphor is a particularly helpful one to think about our calling in our particular context. So, Ray, can we, can we just talk a little bit about the power of these metaphors. We, I'd like to flesh out a little bit the difference between those metaphors and what it looks like to live your Christian life thinking about one versus the other. But let's talk a little bit about the power of metaphors in everyday life. That seems to me that something not that we think about too much, but it is a really important, important thing to think about. Yeah, it is. And I, I agree with you. And I think sometimes, and, and Reformed Christians, although I would say the evangelical world as a whole has been guilty of this, we have emphasized, especially in the last 50 years, very much a worldview approach to understanding. And most of us uh, have been taught along the way, you know, borrowing Calvin's glasses or spectacles image from, from the Institute where he talks about putting, a, you know, we, we see the world through the eyes of faith along the way. But that's a very rational approach. It appeals to the cognitive. It appeals to the mind in terms of understanding. And yet most of us live our lives while we, we seek to be rational. Most of our decisions aren't entirely rational. I think back to St. Augustine, who talked about the ordering of our loves. And uh, Jamie Smith, in his recent book, You Are What You Love, has highlighted that. We are not brains on sticks, walking around, making every decision in a totally cognitive way. We, in fact, are shaped by passions, by loves. And within that, we make sense of the world by a story. And, you know, the Bible is not just a set of truths. The Bible is a story that tells the story of the world in terms of its purpose from the Garden of Eden in Genesis 1 to the city in Revelations 22. We are called, the people of God are called to be part of that story, and obviously that story leads through its climax in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is, right from, right from the Old Testament to Revelation 22, God is carrying out his purpose. He's revealed his purposes, he's carried out his purposes, and he's called us to be part of that. So it's when we see ourselves in the story of the Scriptures, then we understand, okay, what role do I have in that story? And, you know, I think that's where the metaphors come, come through. And there are times, indeed, we're called to fight like soldiers. We are reminded throughout with the pilgrimage example that our temptation is not to read to the end of the story to be caught up in the here and now. And therefore, we need to be reminded that we are pilgrims, that this story has a much longer trajectory. But I think in terms of the thing we're talking about today in terms of particularly how do Christians relate to non-Christians in the world around us? And how does our Christian faith apply to non-churchy activities? When I go to work, when I go to school, when I deal with my neighbors, when I engage in politics, when I read the newspaper, when I think of that stuff, I think the ambassador metaphor, to think of myself in all of these things as an ambassador of Christ, recognizing his lordship over it all, and seeking to also communicate as an ambassador, um, understanding, learning the language of the country to which I have been sent, engaging in diplomacy, seeking an, an ambassador, you know, the, the British ambassador, the French ambassador to Canada. He's, there's part of him that, or her that identifies with the country. They follow along the news with the country. They, they, they're not Canadians. They're French or British, but they become proud in the accomplishments of the country. They're invested in it. And I think Christians have a certain sense in which the world is not an evil place. It's God's world. And we're called here, and he's using this world to carry it out. So it leads to a much more positive understanding, recognizing the very real dangers, because it's God's world that's been invaded by, by sin, Satan, and the, the results of that are not just around us. As the scriptures say, Satan and sin, Satan, and the flesh. The results are, are inside of us as well. 
Ray, I, I think that's a very sound uh, theology there. It, you know, John Stott used the language of incarnational. Jesus remained the Son of God, and yet he became human and inhabited human space. And similarly, we are to remain Christian, but we inhabit uh, the space of the world without losing our identity. But isn't it the case that we are more than ambassadors? This is this is very uh, unpopular language now, but isn't there a sense in which we need to colonize earth with the life of heaven? And isn't it the case that the story in which we situate ourselves is a meta narrative or an overarching story, maybe even a totalizing story? And, and these are all concepts that people push back against because we're not just speaking on behalf of another realm, but aren't we trying to change this other realm in which we find ourselves in? And how can we do that and talk about that in ways that is inviting and maybe not threatening, especially to people in a post-Christian country? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You use the word colonize, and I'd have to think about that a little bit. There's part of me that steps back and isn't I, I know what you mean, and I think I agree with what you mean, but I would step back in the sense that if I colonize something, it's something that belongs to someone else first, and I'm now claiming it. And I actually think that Christians have a very positive approach to the world because it starts, as I mentioned, with that creation, fall, redemption, restoration. The world was made by God. It was his. And even though it rebelled in sin— Already in Genesis 3.15, we have the promise all the way through in terms of that, you know, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. It is Christ. And, you know, we, we often in these conversations go back to Abram Kuyper's famous saying that there isn't a square inch over which he says it, is, it doesn't say it is mine. So there is a sense in which we're not coming in to colonize something that is someone else's. We are actually here as an ambassador and claiming the crown rights of Jesus Christ over the world that is his and that is given to him. And, you know, ultimately every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. So I, I'm a little uncomfortable with the colonizing metaphor, but I, I don't, I think, that, you know, at the core of your question is this reality that we are dealing with a culture that does not recognize the crown rights of Jesus Christ that does not recognize the world as something that belongs to God, but rather sees it as something that is theirs, theirs to inhabit, and that their choice and the social contract that they have with each other is, is of preeminence. And certainly we in diplomatic, appropriate, but nonetheless forceful and prophetic manner need to be faithful in asserting what, um, who, what the world is, what it was meant to be, and why it exists. Yeah, that, that language of colonizing earth with the life of heaven is taken from N.T. Wright's comments on Philippians, because Philippi was a Roman colony, and Paul makes this point that our citizenship is in heaven, and so there could be some kind of analogy there that Paul is drawing out for the Philippians, that just as they are a colony of Rome, so Christians are a colony of heaven. But I really appreciated the way you phrase that. You know, this is God's world. The, the public square belongs to Jesus, and we are simply trying to get people to recognize that. At the same time, I wonder if you could just share with us, you know, what ex exactly we're to do with culture. You mentioned Kuiper and there, you know, the, the language of transform was, was quite uh, prominent. James Davidson Hunter talks about faithful presence. I wonder if you could just comment again about how we might, again, to borrow your language now, get people to recognize that this is God's world, and that Jesus is King. Yeah, I'm. Um, there, there, there's been quite a debate, especially in the last two decades. You know, very quickly the narrative was, especially since the 70s or so, Christians have become much more engaged. For the first 20 or 30 years, it was very politically framed, and it had a culture war feel to it. I think that that sort of around the 2000 or so 
there, there was a sense in which a lot of people looked back and said, what is that getting us? And, you know, I will readily acknowledge I, I grew up, I cut my teeth in politics in the 1980 Canadian federal election. I, I know this is a podcast of a church, so I need to be careful. I have to confess to having perhaps broken one of the commandments and lied about my age when I signed my first political party membership card. So don't tell anybody about that. So I wasn't quite legal, but I did join in the 1980 election, and I've been active in politics ever since. It was in the late 90s when Michael Van Pelt, the co-founder of Cardis, and myself looked back and came to a conclusion ourselves and our own personal experience that I think mirrors the broader literature. We thought we were all being unique in that. And then you discover a few years later, there's tons of books that articulate exactly what it is you're going through and you're actually just behind the time zone along the way. But really, we asked the question, what was some of this culture war stuff in which we had engaged? What was it actually getting us? And we were concluding, we were slipping behind. We were potentially politicizing things that ought not to be politicized and that there ought to be different strategies. And, and the creation of Cardis in 2000 as a, as a think tank was, in fact, a response to a different model of cultural engagement. James Davison Hunter wrote uh, To Change the World that you mentioned in 2010. We actually brought him to Canada on a five-city tour and engaged significantly with him in 2005. And the notion of faithful presence and you know, I won't, I, I, we don't want to become tedious for the listeners along the way, but essentially what Hunter does is takes the good, the true, and the beautiful. And he says that if those are the things that we're pursuing, then there is sort of a, an elite level, whether that's a philosophy department or an arts museum or, or the music of the day. Often the ideas are seeded there, they're translated into and popularized into policies, into curriculums, and ultimately they manifest themselves in day-to-day -day life. And he identifies, if you, if you think of a three-by-three three box, if you will, with the good, the true, the beautiful, and then you've got the theoretical, the translation, and the practical, you can point to different institutions of society, be they seminaries, church, family, business organizations that fit in those nine squares. And Hunter's thesis effectively is that Christians have focused only on a few things, on, on politics, for example, and not on the arts. And Hunter says that if, if in fact, we're to have an effective Christian witness in society, we need a faithful presence in all of those squares. And it's not a strategy, it's a presence. It's seeking to be obedient in terms of God's calling. If you're an artist, as an artist, you know, somewhere along the line, he makes the comment that to join the, the uh, symphony orchestra is as political an act as to join a political party. And I think that's really at the heart of it, that our public square engagement is not just about politics. It's about all of life. It's about our vocations. It's about our callings. And we can tie that back, of course. He doesn't use the ambassador language, but I will. We can tie that back to the biblical notion that we are sent as ambassadors, each with our own calling, each in our own sphere. So if I could jump in there, Ray, if, if you were to take a you know, sort of a, a remote control and rewind back 50 years in Canadian Reformed church life, you would hear a lot of preachers talking off the pulpit about the antithesis. They would be talking about the separation between the world and the church. It goes back to, you know, this, this metaphor of, you know, a, a warfare metaphor, us versus them. You know, you would hear people talking about the need to maintain the antithesis or to, you know, to make sure that we don't have this, this, uh, this, mixing between the church and the world that got played out and how people thought about friendships and how people thought about their everyday life and who they worked for and with and and who they had in their home and around their table and you know all of those things and so and you know you fast forward now to 50 years later and here we are and we're talking about faithful presence in all kinds of different areas within society and about being ambassadors to you know to the culture what what has happened in, you know, from, from your perspective, you know, the Canadian Reformed Church is pretty well, you're, you're a, a free reform background. What's happened that that has gotten us from there to where we are in this conversation here? What, what is what has changed that that allows us to have this conversation here now? Well, I, I'm going to add, can I give both a yes and a no answer? Um, sure. To, to, to your question there. So affirming, first of all, that change that you've had, that we've moved from antithesis to where we are today. I, I think part of that 
that antithesis was very much of, uh, defined by institutions. So within the church was us, outside of the church was them. And we saw the world. And, you know, of course, this was, this was religiously informed, but it also had certain demographic, you know, these were Dutch immigrants. You know, it used to be that if you married somebody who was not of Dutch ancestry, you were marrying a Canadian. You know, even the language was there in terms of us and them. And something was protecting of a way of life, a culture, and everything else. There was a, the comprehensiveness of the call of the gospel was well understood by the, our previous generation and embedded, but it was very much a defensive sort of mindset, us against them. And the line was the church wall and the church membership and our confessional identity. I want to suggest today that we actually don't have enough antithesis preaching to, to flip that around. Except I think the challenge of that is that the line between, you know, the, the antithesis, the kingdom of God, and that is not between the church and the world, just that certainly is true and all the rest, but it's not between us and them, but rather we need a deeper sense of it runs through our own heart. I think we need to understand the fact that perhaps part of the reason we're not as keen on the antithesis today is that we in our own daily lives reflect the world. For most of us, the typical Canadian reform, free reform, suburban family, you know, professionally successful, living, you know, a moderate to above average income existence with the cars in the driveway and all the luxuries that our society has. The reality is we're pretty materialistic. And if we take a look at, at what our calling is, I, I, I'm right now doing some work on Abram, and I'm re remarkable that Abraham in Genesis 11, when we're introduced to him, you know, is there in the Ur of the Chaldees? He's a moon worshiper, just like everybody else in that time. And, you know, for him, the call of the gospel and the promise that God came to him was, wasn't, you know, if you'd only stop your drinking a little bit, and if you would only go to church twice on Sundays and engage in Bible study, then you'd be a Christian. No, it was leave everything that you have. It was a radical call to a total transformed life and the promise of and being sent in a day, being sent on a mission, if you will, to the promised land to care, you know, as the recipient of God's promises. I wonder whether or not some of that radical call that that is there that's as relevant for us is is lost. So I wonder whether or not part of the answer actually we need to turn the finger back at ourselves and wonder whether or not we don't hear the antithesis because we may be bought into many of the values of the world as well. Yeah, and, and this I, I so agree with you on that. And this is where I think thinking through the metaphors that we use to think about the Christian life is important. And I'm not sure if you know, the, the ambassador metaphor that you're suggesting, well, no, no metaphor is going to be, be able to capture everything that we want to say, but that, that idea of the ambassador, as well as the warfare metaphor, both of them are sort of like, well, it's us and God over here, and we're now going over there to the world. You know, it, it, they're, they're, they're the ones that are in need. The ambassador metaphor is good because it, it you know, we're going on a, on a mission for good. We're, we're, we're bringing goodness to them. The warfare metaphor tends to be a little bit more negative in that regard, although it's biblical as well. I really love the, the it's maybe not such a, a metaphor as the picture that you find in Ezekiel 22, where you've got all this judgment, the God, God judging the, you know, the, the people of God. And then where God says, I, I'm looking for someone to stand in the gap. And it's the image of God coming in judgment to attack a city. And there's a gap in the wall. And he's looking for someone in the city to stand in the gap to stop him from coming in in judgment. And, and he, so he's looking for us. He's, he's looking for us who are part of the sinful city, recognizing our own faults, our, our own need for repentance, our own, you know, that we've been perhaps living too much like the world. And that in repentance, we would stand in the gap for the protection and for the, you know, out of love for the people in the city. So there's an ambassador metaphor related there, but I like it because it demonstrates that the judgment of God comes against us as well in our own hearts, as you, as you said, like the, the antithesis runs through our own hearts. And yeah, I think that I, I really love that image because it seems to capture, you know, a couple of the different things that we're talking about. No, and I, I agree. And, you know, of course, these are all biblical images that have, have their place. We, it, it, it's a, when you're picking one, it's always important to highlight we're not choosing one at the expense of the other, yeah. but we're, 
we're trying to draw out certain features and certain lessons that each of them has for us and apply to our time. And I wonder too, if it's the case that one metaphor maybe makes more sense at one phase in history than another metaphor does at another phase. But it's interesting because you're in the realm of public policy and public theology. The ideas that you're sharing are exactly those that are found in the missional church movement, or at least in that part of the missional uh, church movement that has very solid theological moorings. But we're often told that we should not think in terms of our preaching of us versus them either. And so instead of saying, ours is a materialistic society, we should say, we are a materialistic people. And it's an important point to note, because to be a missional church does not mean Mm -hmm. to preach a different gospel. It's the same gospel that everybody needs, because everybody is a sinner and in need of of Christ. And then, but secondly, I wanted to, to think about the arts a little bit more, because Again, uh, missiologists sometimes talk about third space or space that's inhabited by both uh, believers and unbelievers, a kind of non-threatening environment. And sometimes uh, music and the arts are referred to as a third language. It's language that both, again, believers and unbelievers use. So there, there's there's some kind of common ground there. But So you mentioned the arts. How do you propose... Christians be involved in the world in terms of the arts? Is this contributing artwork to the local gallery? Is this housing art in one's church? Is this patronizing good artists? Do you have any ideas in particular about what that might look like? Well, I would say yes to all of the above. It's somewhat ironic, anybody who has watched me draw, or even has gone to an art gallery with me, which I do from time to time, I do so more out of a sense of philosophic duty and understanding of the importance than I do of an inherent aesthetic taste that I have. I don't have a very refined aesthetic palette, especially when it comes to the visual arts. And for a while in our family, we tried Friday night movie nights, and they were made famous by uh, the signal that dad would fall asleep within um, a very short period of time. So I'm not the example to follow in that regard. But I do think there are a couple of things. Let's go back to the foundation. God is a God of beauty. And God delights in beauty as much as he does in truth. And I think sometimes that, you know, when we start with that, then understand the fact that, you know, there is a sense in which we've been giving these gifts that we have, we have to steward over. And when we cultivate the gifts of the arts, you know, yes, there are messages communicated in the arts. There's also a beauty that's communicated. That's part of God's good creation that he gave us that we're called to carry out. Now, we recognize, you know, the very, you know, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, the fall. We recognize that the arts are a pretty tricky place for many Christians to be in today because it many of the themes and, and some of the forms of art that are popular in contemporary culture go are in direct violation of God's word and God's revealed ways. And so there's a real challenge in terms of navigating that space. But fundamentally, and I think this is what distinguishes, especially in our age, which is so empty. It's, you know, we sometimes say it's nihilistic. It, there's nothing there. And, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of work right now on euthanasia, medical assistance in dying with the current legislation there. And what strikes me is, you know, you can argue all the politics and the policies, and I'm privileged to be in circles in which I'm engaging with people who profoundly disagree with me on the meaning of life and all the rest. But what gets me is the emptiness and the hopelessness that informs their conclusion. In many ways, they want medical assisted euthanasia to be, to be made legal so that when there is suffering, they can end the suffering because suffering is evil. Well, in many ways, you know, when artists understand this and much art communicates the learning and the growth that can come through suffering, and we know that, you know, while suffering is certainly a result of the fall, God uses suffering to, to illustrate and to highlight his, his, his glory in many ways. And sometimes the arguments that words can't reach them with, the messages of art can. 
And so I think, you know, there, there is art for its own sake because it's beauty, because we worship a God of beauty. But I also think the arts have a certain utilitarian opportunity that perhaps we have underestimated, even in our witness to uh, those we profoundly disagree with. Yeah, I, I really like that. Those are sort of profound thoughts there. I mean, art is not as intimidating as words are because the the message is kind of elusive. I think that's the language that Calvin Searvelt used. You're not bombarded with something when you see artwork, and yet artwork has the capacity to show something that is true about the world, but in a in a very beautiful way. And I suppose art is the capacity to show what is truly ugly about the world as well. That might be the case. Can I just jump in on that, on that point for a moment though, Bill, because I, th- I think actually uh, I've highlighted within Cardis, we on a regular basis internally try to review what are the biggest questions out there? What are the most strategic things? And we have sort of come to the conclusion that one of the biggest crises of our generation of our time is a totally warped anthropology, a totally warped understanding of what does it mean to be human? And, you know, I, I mentioned earlier the fact that we're not brains on sticks, but I think the, the Christian church in particular needs to, to stop and reflect on that, because everybody will nod, yes, we agree with that. And yet we spend so much of our time purely trying to convince people using rationalistic or cognitive arguments, and we think that if we win the debate, we win the day. And the reality is there's often times where we have the best arguments and the best data and the other side. So I still believe what I, what I want to believe it, it, it isn't convincing. The example I use often is learning to drive a car. I don't know, maybe you guys are way better than, than I was, but when I was taught to drive again, I grew up on a farm, so it was a little before it was legal in terms of 16, but I, when I was taught to drive along the way, I remember being taught on a with a manual transition uh, transmission and being very conscious, sitting behind there. Okay, clutch in, put into gear, clutch out, foot on the gas. Not at the same time. Well, didn't work. Stop and start. But I remember early on when you drove, and you even have it when you drive, and you're on your way in a in a geography you're unfamiliar with, and you you know I've got to go three seat streets to the. Uh, north and two streets to the side you're very step by step you watch it well once you get used to driving once you're driving on a regular basis i used to do a 60 kilometer commute every day and there were many days i could not tell you a single thing of whether or not traffic was busy or not because i had my pod i had i was listening to something on the on the radio and had not given one thought to driving and yet drove back and forth to my destination And I think that's how we live most of life. Most of what we do is intuitive. It's not cognitive. We don't consciously think about everything that we do. And therefore, if we're going to reach the culture, it's in the daily routines, the liturgies of life, the things we just do every day and take for granted. We we need to find a way to to enter that space if we're going to challenge people in terms of what they're thinking, because I don't think just data and vocabulary and arguments are going to necessarily win the day. No, I think you're exactly right. And this is why, you know, a Billy Graham crusade isn't effective nowadays. It's why a lot of apologetics isn't effective. People need to see in daily life, the effectiveness of the gospel. And I suspect that's partly what James Davidson Hunter was getting after, you know, being present in institutions so people could see in a tangible way how this works, because merely uh, winning an intellectual argument wasn't going to do it. And that's certainly been my experience talking to unchurched people in the city of Hamilton. They're almost uninterested in the debate, but on the other hand, they're willing to be a friend. And I think it's going to be through relationships and through our presence in our neighborhoods that the light of the gospel is going to shine, especially. Winston, it looked like you had a question there. 
Yeah, I'm just trying to think, you know, then, you know, let's say you're a you're an average church member of a Canadian Reformed church, you would like your church to be reaching out into the community in a in a broader way, you would love to see people come to living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It seems to me that what we're what we're suggesting through this conversation is that part of the your the, you know, on the ground living out your missional mandate as a Christian is to 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 be to lead a holy life and to to lead a, a life that a beautiful life a life that demonstrates to the world around them the all you know all of the beauty of being a Christian in the various various areas of life. So, I, uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Ray. You know, I, I would say, I really, the, the word as you're speaking, the word that jumps to my mind is plausibility. In our culture, you know, the modernism and everything else that has been inculcated through our education system, even the postmodernism of identity, has made the culture at large deaf to the arguments that are there. And you know, thankfully, we're we're Christians. We believe in the sovereignty of God. We know that that's you know that that God in His in his providence and in his sovereignty can overcome that. But in terms of day-to-day life, my sense is that whether it's our neighbors or our co-workers, we make the gospel plausible when we live in which there is, you know, Peter talks about always being ready to give reason of the hope that's within you. For people to ask about the hope that's in you, they need you to see live. They need to see you living a hopeful life. And I wonder whether or not in our mixed workplaces and that, whether our secular neighbors, you know, say, you know what, I'm working with Winston. He's a good guy. He's an honest guy like everybody else. He doesn't cheat and all the rest. Honest days work for an honest day's pay. That's all there. That's all should be a given. But I wonder if the characteristic they can define about us is hopeful. That we're not the people who all this world is just going downhill and it's all a mess and nothing good is coming. And we have nothing good to say about anything, but rather... That in the course of, you know, let's say you're in a manufacturing thing, wondering about the amazing creation that put the laws of nature in place that allows whatever technology it is that you're engaged with, celebrating the the, the, the providences of God, and, you know, even as covenant faithfulness and the sun rising every morning and new days and opportunities being given, living lives of thankfulness, hope that communicate a plausibility to everyone around us. And that's that's not something for ARPA and for CARDIS and for church committees and everything else. That's something for each of us in our own individual lives to carry out in our setting. And hopefully the various organizations that are doing are, are, are providing some tools and some ways and to help you carry that out. But ultimately, the mission of the church is is a mission that belongs to her members and that and not to organizations. Which speaks again to this idea of of what kind of metaphors we're thinking thinking about as we think about our role in the world. If you're primarily operating from the, you know, in a in a metaphor of warfare and you're confronted with the issues of the day, well then you're you're going to perhaps act like like you're at war and that's going to affect how you speak and how you interact and how you you know how you talk about the government and how you talk about the world, how you talk about the church. But if you are thinking about an ambassador and if you're thinking about I I have a I have a, a message that I need to bring to the world around me and I need to represent the king to the world around me and to think about how I do that and how that's going to be received. And then I'm going to pay careful attention to the, the world around me and how they, how they perceive what I'm saying and how they're looking at my own life and whether or not they, you know, the, the video of my life is going to match the audio of the gospel, whether or not there's plausibility there, then the power of the metaphor, you know, really kicks in there. So so yeah, I, th- I think that there's it's important for us to be thinking as we engage this on these big pictures, the, on the big picture of what's the metaphor, what's the controlling image that we're using as we approach this, and recognize that that's going to affect the words that you have, the the actions that you take. And yeah, I'm 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 concerned that whatever you might think about current regulations, restrictions, and whatnot, that we all need to be thinking about. Are we promoting the cause of Jesus Christ? Are we promoting the cause of the gospel, not just to government leaders, but to all those who are looking in and observing us in our everyday life? And it's interesting and very well said, Winston. I, I, I may steal your, the, the audio of uh, the gospel matching the video of our lives as a new definition of plausibility. I think that's, that's, a, that's a great picture. I think one thing further, sometimes in this context, we, we hear about conscience and 
you know, my Christian liberty in terms of some of this. And I've been bothered by some of what I hear in the sense that when I read, you know, Romans 14 in terms of the exercise of con- the Christian liberty there is of not forcing others. It's not about claiming rights for ourselves. There's a sacrificial element to the Christian liberty. And what I sometimes hear in our current context is it's as if the church is seeking to grab the rights for herself and being conscious of objectors. And that's why, as I said, I use the language of justice. Uh, which is the norm for the state. If we truly believe the state is operating unjustly, it is violating God's law and God's righteousness, we are to proclaim that. We have a call to do that. And that takes courage and that takes wisdom. But we need to do that not in a way that, you know, tries to eliminate and hide, as I said, but it needs to be bold, proclaiming, and prepared to face the consequences. I I have a question for you, Ray. Again, on the... the the idea of metaphors. I know that in my own life, depending where I am emotionally, what circumstances I'm faced with, I gravitate to certain metaphors more than others. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm feeling attacked or if I think the church is being attacked, I might gravitate more to a biblical warfare imagery. If I'm feeling sort of uh, down lost or yeah, tired, perhaps I gravitate more to a pilgrim metaphor. If I'm feeling more confident, and, and hopeful, then maybe I gravitate more to an ambassador metaphor. And so a lot of that seems in my own life reliant on how I'm, how I'm feeling at the moment or the circumstances I'm faced with. Are, are you suggesting, you know, as you did at the, the beginning, saying that perhaps we've, we've underutilized the metaphor of, of the ambassador, are you suggesting that, that Christians in this point in time ought to be reminding themselves or sort of forcing themselves to think along a particular metaphor? That, that that would be a good idea to do and not allow ourselves to sort of be swayed by how we're feeling at the moment? Well, you know, there's 150 psalms for a reason. David had quite a range of emotions. and At different times he wrote psalms and you lay them alongside each other and you say, how can this be the same guy? So um, you're going, you're asking me this question today. It's informed by a particular, my answer was informed by my own read of the cultural context that's immediate in which we are here right now in terms of the need of the moment right now. There are other settings. And if we were, you know, if we were doing this in, you know, you know, Burkina Faso, where, where you have been in the past or in a totally different culture and context, our answers might be very, very different. So I think there's a contextual element. We are, you know, not every ambassador has the same message. Canada's ambassador to the United States right now has a different message than Canada's ambassador to China, which has a different message than Canada's ambassador to France, and yet they're all Canada's ambassadors. And so there is a read of the context that is there, which, you know, at different times, different metaphors have, have different currency. This was also my own read, not just of the culture, but of the church and where we are collectively at and... You know, if, if I might say, I, I think the ambassador is perhaps an antidote. I, I, I think we've had quite a bit of the warfare mentality and, and um, that mindset is reasonably dominant in our own heritage and relatively recent past. And without, and I point my finger at myself as much as anything that can as easily lead to a smugness and us versus them and God is on our side and we're better than you are. And I don't think that's, uh, that rings true. That doesn't have a gospel tone. And I also don't think it's, it's the right place to, uh, to proceed. So it's an attempt to be positive and hopeful in terms of that we are ambassadors that has a message for this culture, for this context, and for this time. Well, Richard Mao pointed out to me a while back how many of the periodicals in the continental reform tradition had military titles like banner or clarion or torch and trumpet. And so that's certainly part of our history. We're almost out of time. Uh, Ray, I'm just wondering if you could uh, answer this final question. You do preach, of course, from time to time, but you're not uh, a pastor. What piece of advice would you want to impart to pastors and church leaders in terms of these things that we've discussed? Is there a book you think we should read, a habit we should develop, counsel that you want to impart to encourage us as we conclude? Mm -hmm. 
Well, there's a library I'd like you to read as opposed to a book. But if I had to pick um, just one, Paul Williams came and let me actually just get you the title properly. This is a book that just came out this year, Exiles on Mission. And he does a quite a good job, I think, in terms of really cultivating out both the ambassador, um, the ambassador metaphor. He also, at the very end, very helpful articulates the Christian. He he uses Goheen and Bartholomew's six acts framework, but he applies it to seven secular worldviews as well, and lays them alongside each other. And in terms of both a um, an honest analysis of the times, as well as a framework for going forward of what does it mean to be an ambassador of Christ in our context, it, it's by no means a definitive book. I, books need to be out a lot more than six months before they um, deserve classic or anything of this sort. And I'm not suggesting this one necessarily will, but it's a very timely book that I highly recommend. Great. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you for encouraging us to be ambassadors, to think about the metaphors that we use, and to be ambassadors, especially of hope. It's been great chatting to you, and uh, God bless to you. God bless all your work that you're doing at Cardis. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. God bless you. Bill, let's chat a little bit about that, that interview with Ray. I'd like to ask you this question or hear you out on, on this issue. I remember as a, as a boy in a Canadian Reformed church, or at that point in time, a church in Australia, hearing people say, look, we don't need to go out and tell other people about Jesus. We just have to live holy, good lives. You know, and and the the church can send missionaries to tell people of Jesus. It's not our responsibility to do so. Just live a good life. So that's sort of like, you know, one side. And then on the far other side, you would get people that that say almost something similar, but it's sort of social gospel. It's like, well, you don't need to go tell people about Jesus. Just follow the example of Jesus and do good things. It seems to me that this whole idea of plausibility and this whole idea of living a, a hopeful Christian life in all the different realms of society is sort of a third way that avoids both of those dangers or both of those extremes. And yet, from an outside perspective, could almost look kind of similar. So, yeah, do you, do you, do you know what I'm saying? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. And of course, I think this idea is embedded in the Heidelberg Catechism as well. It's one of the reasons why we obey the law so that by our godly walk, we might win our neighbors over to Christ. And I read a book by by John uh, Dixon, I believe that's his name, an Australian, some time ago in which he made a distinction between presenting the gospel and promoting the gospel. And he argued that some people are called very specifically to present the claims of Christ verbally, but that all of us are called to promote the gospel. And I think this means a little bit more than just living a holy life. I really liked what Ray said there about being an ambassador it's living a holy life while being self-consciously Christian, while being conscious that one is a Christian ambassador. So I don't know the language that he used. Was it utilitarian or, or pragmatic or something like that at one point? But I, I think we need to, to live a distinctive life consciously that we are Christians and that we are trying to promote the claims of Christ by how we live. Because let's face it, you can live a holy life in a way that in the end isn't that different from a very moral neighbor of yours. So what is distinctively Christian in particular about the way you live? And I think that gives plausibility to the gospel because if people can see how the gospel has transformed your life so that you have hope, and I really like the way that Ray underscored the importance of hope, because it really is what distinguishes us, I think, from our unchurched neighbors. But if we can live the beautiful life that conveys hope, I think that's one way in which we give the gospel plausibility. It might be enough for people to say, you know, I, I notice that you are not, you know, unnerved or undone by terrible things that you hear in the news, but you, you get up and you have a hopeful presence. Uh, I'd be curious to hear what is it that animates you. I think that kind of phenomenon would then be likely. Yeah. So, so if we're working, you know, on the job site at the factory, going to school, working at whatever business we're, we're involved in, to really be intentional about, about living a life so that, 
if in the future I'm given the opportunity to speak about Jesus to somebody, they're not going to immediately think of, well, look at, you know, who is this guy to, to say that? No, or I've been I've been watching you for six months, and you know, look what kind of person you are. And that doesn't mean that we're going to live this perfect this perfect Christian life, you know, on the job site or in our relationships. It'll mean that we're we're willing to admit when we're wrong. We're willing to be humble. We're willing to confess our mistakes and you know, apologize for it. It means that uh, we we live hopeful when we talk about you know the social issues around us. That we don't you know uh, join people in slander. That we watch our language and apologize if we you know if we make missteps there. That that we're we're living humble Jesus like lives to the best of our ability, and then running to Jesus when we recognize that we don't. So yeah, trying to live a life wherever you are, wherever God's placed you, hoping and praying you get the opportunity to speak about Jesus and doing your best to live your life so that when the opportunity does come, people won't be like, whoa, this this is so unexpected from this person. Yeah, I think that's that's very true. That's a great point that just being humble and acknowledging your failures and your sins is one way in which we powerfully convey the gospel. I'm thinking, too, of language that I would often hear growing up from those in the church around me about how to be distinctive. And people would say things like, oh, my neighbors know I'm a Christian because they see me go to church on Sunday, or they see that I don't cut my grass on Sunday. I'm not sure that those are, are, are witnesses for Christ necessarily. They might, they might indicate to your neighbors that, that you're, you're different in some ways, but I'm not sure that that in and, of, in and of itself conveys the beauty of the gospel. So it has to go a little bit beyond that. It has to be concern for the neighbor. It has to be interest in the neighbor. What do you think? Yeah, I think the idea of being the best neighbor you can be, to, to be the best neighbor you can be, to treat others as you would love to be treated yourself. And then Ray's comment about how the antithesis runs through our own hearts. That seems to be, that's such a core element for me in, in being a good neighbor and leading a, a Christian life that makes the gospel message plausible to people who hear it, to recognize that it's not just me versus you, us versus them, but that, you know, I'm a sinner too. The, the antithesis runs through my own heart, but I've got the hope of Christ that makes the world of difference. That seems to be a, a key fundamental, under, you know, uh, character trait or understanding that allows us to be a good neighbor. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that point he made in part because of the relevance that it has for the church's ministry and for preaching, for example, we are drawing a line in our preaching, and it's not between the church and the world only, at least. It's between sin and grace, and that's the line that cuts right through all of our hearts. So that, that was a great point that, in some sense, we need to underscore the, the antithesis more than we have been, but to recognize that the antithesis is within us. It's a little bit like, you know, the those in the Anabaptistic tradition, like Mennonites and Hutterites, believe that they could somehow escape the problem of evil by huddling on, on a colony off to the side. And I think this this is why that approach does not work, because sin lives in our hearts, and we can't escape it in that sense. Well, let's go from here understanding and thinking about that understanding of the antithesis and then struggling with our metaphors so that we can walk out to the world, not just thinking through the metaphors of, of warfare, for, for example, but thinking about being ambassadors of Jesus Christ, his person and his gospel message. Thank you so much for, for having this discussion with me, Bill. We'll see you next time. You're welcome. Thanks, Winston. Thank you.